Hey guys, Woodruff here. Um, so now we're getting into um, a big topic, which is stroke. This has a lot of, hold on a sec. Sorry about that. Um, so anyway, uh, so we're getting to a big topic, stroke. So this has, uh, there's a lot of questions about this. Um, this is a very prevalent disease. This is a lot like diabetes where it's, um, it's very common. Uh, and so this is something uh, I would be very surprised if many people got through um, nursing school in CLEX without seeing stroke many, 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 many times. And I don't mean like in a patient, but like testing and stuff like that, too. It's a big topic. So it's definitely something that you want to understand. So um, yeah, as we're going in, let's go ahead and get started. I'm breaking this down. And just as a warning, too, um, I, you know, I started doing some of my other neuro stuff and I had like ICP and GCS in my other neurological disorders PowerPoints. And now I decided to move it to stroke because I feel like it fits in more because it's more of the acute stuff. So you might kind of see some stuff and be like, wait, isn't there a different video she did about that? Like, I'm not going to re-lecture over it, but you might see me skim through and be like, huh, wasn't this in a different lecture? You know, So don't mind me. Sometimes it takes me like talking it out loud um, to realize where it fits best. So Anyway, um, let's get in. So there's, this is a great, um, you know, um, uh, we got a simple nursing explanation about stroke if you are a visual person, highly recommend. So let's talk about what a stroke is. And this video will be broken down into multiple, multiple pieces because stroke is a big topic. Um, but first, we're just gonna talk about what it is, who gets it, that kind of stuff. Um, so stroke is effectively like a heart attack in the brain where there's either not enough flow to the brain there's and there's sometimes an obstruction like a clot um, or there's bleeding in the brain that leads to um, and both of these lead to like death um, or brain cell death um, and so if my brain cells are dying what happens um, I'm losing function. And that's why this is incredibly debilitating because, you know, it's um, even though it's horrible for your beautiful, beautiful heart to have some cells that are um, going to die, like with the brain, there's just so many areas of the brain, like the brain is responsible for everything I'm doing right now. It's responsible for my awkwardness. It's responsible for how fast I'm talking. It's responsible for my temperature, my heart rate. Um, it's responsible for so many things, um, like everything about my personality, my movement, my speech, um, I could go on and on and on, but you get the point. Um, so if I'm losing this, like patients with a stroke can have incredible debilitation, debilitation, is that a word? I think so. I'm going to create it as a word if it's not, um, they can have incredible debility. Maybe that's a better, better word, debility. Um, and they can lose the ability to move, to have sensation, to be able to think, talk, um, uh, they can have changes to their emotion, to their personality, um, and it can affect all of the above too, which can make it, you know, even that much harder. <clears throat> oh, so let's get back into cardiac and some other risk factors. So this is also why I get a little bit more, you know, excited when we talk about stroke, because stroke is a cardiovascular disorder. Woo -hoo! Um, and sorry, I, I, stroke is a very serious topic and I'm not mocking stroke. I love stroke and I don't mean I love stroke because it's wonderful. I love stroke teaching about it because it's an important topic to teach, but also because it's cardiovascular. Anyway, it's my last taste of cardiovascular for the semester, even though, you know, I'm going to keep bringing up everything, how it's related to cardiovascular. And that's just what you get. You chose to watch these videos is all I'm saying. Glutton for punishment. Um, so which of the following would increase a client's risk for a stroke? Select all that apply. Um, so the first one says an LDL of 90. So I need to do two things here. I need to figure out what this lab or diagnostic tells me. And then I need to figure out, is it a risk factor for stroke? So LDL, so those are your low density lipoproteins, the type of cholesterol. These are the ones that we want low. Um, we like them less than 130, I believe. Um, so it's less than 130, it's normal. So if something's normal, it's probably not going to increase their risk. Like it's not like if their cholesterol is normal, I can't see how normal cholesterol would increase someone's risk for stroke. If it was high, I think it would, but if it's normal, I would say no. BMI of 32. So we haven't gone into, we've talked a lot about BMI and you, uh, by now, hopefully you know your BMI, but you know, less than 25 is normal. 
25 to 30 is um, overweight and 30 and above is obese. So if I'm at 32, I'm at obese. So it's saying, is obesity a risk factor for a stroke? And the answer is yes. Um, obesity um, increases, you know, it, it, obesity is a very um, heavy cardiovascular risk factor. So we definitely want to um, include this in uh, my uh, stroke risk factors. Um, Blood pressure 150 over 79. Um, so having high could having high blood pressure increase my risk for stroke? Well, we said that stroke is like where there's like decreased flow or bleeding in the brain, which leads to brain cell death. So I have to think, would my blood pressure being on the high end of normal, which would be like vasoconstricted, could that affect flow to my brain? The answer is yes. Hypertension is actually probably one of the biggest risk factors or the biggest risk factor for stroke. Um, then there's hemoglobin A1C 8.5. So this would take, and I'm sure you're tired of seeing these because I do them all the time. Um, you're like diabetes, diabetes, diabetes. It's like Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. It's like always talking about it, but diabetes is around all the time. You'll get used to it. Um, so hemoglobin A1C, first I have to see, is it normal or not? So this is an elevated hemoglobin A1C. So it's saying, would diabetes put me at risk for stroke? So stroke is a flow problem, a vascular or cardiovascular problem. And so would someone having diabetes put them at risk for flow issues or for bleeding? The answer is yes. Not the bleeding so much, but the flow issues, yes. Um, remember, diabe uh, diabetes and poor glucose control breaks down blood vessels. If my blood vessels are broken down, they're not going to function as well. Um, and they could have a lot of issues, um, which could cause flow issues, which could lead to a stroke. Um, apical pulse regular. Um, so would having a, is, is this normal or not normal? Having an irregular apical pulse, that's good. Um, so um, do we, I thought it dropped something, I guess. Um, so would I be concerned if they have something that's good? Not so much. So um, if this said apical pulse irregular, I would be worried about what? Hmm. Uh, if you said AFib, you are my best friend. You can sign up. I will get you on the mailing list. Just let me know. Um, so an irregular apical pulse um, can be a sign of AFib, and AFib is a risk factor for stroke. So um, what we're looking at here is, you know, um, high cholesterol, which A is, remember, A is normal, So, but I'm just talking out loud. High cholesterol, obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, AFib, these are some big risk factors. We're going to talk about more some more on the uh, next slide. But the answers for this question, in case you're wondering, because I just talked myself in circles, the correct answers are B, C, and D. So who is at risk for um, a stroke? The non-modifiable risk factors are going to be age or thing, uh, like non-modifiable again means that I can't change them or I can't make them better. Remember, modifiable doesn't always mean that I can get rid of a diagnosis, but it does mean that I can make them better. So non-modifiable, I can't change this or make it better. Um, we can't change age. We can't change family history. We can't change um, you know, the, the genetic gender that someone's born with. Um, and, um, also ethnicity is a big thing. Um, just like it was for cardiovascular disease. Um, but most strokes are not as a result of non-modifiable risk factors. They're actually a result of modifiable risk factors. And remember, modifiable means make it better. Um, so 90% of strokes are due to these. So again, I have dot, dot, dot for hypertension, because that is the biggest risk factor for stroke, but then also atrial fibrillation. You might be wondering why, what happens in atrial fibrillation there? If you remember in case, don't worry, I'm going to tell you if you don't, um, atrial fibrillation, there is a, um, what do you call it? Um, a uh, fibrillation of the top of, and like, I'm sitting here having a moment. I was like, oh my God, did I forget about atrial fibrillation for a second? I mean, I got to look at my life choices. If I'm, if I'm ser seriously pausing here, like I thought me and AFib were close. Anyway, AFib, um, top of the heart is fibrillating. And so it leads to stasis or like stalling of the blood, which leads to blood clotting or clogging and blood clots are more likely to form. And as a result of that, if I have bl uh, blood clots forming in my heart, where do they go if they move? They travel out of my heart and straight to my beautiful, beautiful brain. And so um, that's why AFib is a risk factor. Diabetes, we talked about smoking because smoking messes with the lining of the blood vessels, um, which can increase your risk for blood clots, but also it causes vasoconstriction, which decreases flow. We talked about obesity, just everything with being overweight, it affects, it strains the body um, and increases. Um, you can have more plaques and other issues, um, high cholesterol, that kind of stuff. 
um, obesity, uh, uh, sorry, I already said it, hormonal treatments, um, because they can increase your risk for blood clots. So like women that are on birth control and things like that, they could be at an increased risk. Um, drug or alcohol abuse increases your risk, especially that cocaine is horrible for hemorrhagic strokes. People that have bleeding strokes, um, a lot of times if we have a young person come in and they have a brain bleed, like nine times, no, I don't want to say nine times out of 10, um, a young person brain bleed a lot of times it's because they like that cocaine. Um, and then also having a history of a TIA, which we'll talk about next. Yay. So a TIA is like a pre-stroke. It's not an actual stroke, um, but it's pretty much there's little tiny baby clots um, that cause a temporary, temporary. Okay. I just want to make sure I spelled that or that sounded right. That temporarily cause a blockage. So they do not long-term cause a blockage, but pretty much the patient looks like they're having a stroke, but then their symptoms last less than an hour. So they get better. Um, so it's like pretty much kind of think of like a drain that's getting clogged. It's starting to clog a little bit. And at first you're like, Ooh, no, this isn't draining well, but then maybe it clears itself. The clog, um, you know, the clog passes and it's able to drain again. So this is, this is pretty much what happens here, but this is a warning sign. If we're getting micro clots to the point where, um, I can have these little mini strokes, um, like it's definitely very concerning. It is kind of like, it's a warning sign, like, Hey, um, this is, you're going in the wrong direction. So we want to teach these patients about stroke symptoms, how to modify, um, um, their risk factors. Um, there's no cell death that happens at this point. And again, it's just um, something that randomly happens. It's not like, it's not an event where like something got dislodged or happened. It's just sometimes a random occurrence where, I um, mean, you know, a little micro um, emboli just end up getting clogged and causing a temporary blockage, but then they move on and the symptoms pass and um, the patient's okay and had no cell death. So um, there is TIAs or those many baby, um, I don't want to say baby strokes, but um, I would call it those um, temporary stroke-like symptoms. But there's um, for actual strokes, there's two types of strokes that you need to know about. And you don't need to get crazy with the patho, but it is important to understand this, not because they look different. Like if a patient comes in with a thrombotic stroke or an embolic stroke, um, or a hemorrhagic stroke, they can all have the same symptoms because it's all affecting the brain the same way. Um, like in other words, there's not like, hey, they're going to have speech issues if they have a thrombotic or um, if they have weakness on one side, it has to be hemorrhagic. Um, they, they, their story might be a little different about when their symptoms came on and stuff um, or their history can tell us a lot about maybe what type of stroke they're at risk for. Um, but the most important reason why you need to understand ischemic versus hemorrhagic um, is, is that it's going to guide treatment. The treatment that we do when someone has a blood clot in their brain is going to be very different than when someone is bleeding in their brain. And that's really what I want to get across. Um, so there's two types of ischemic strokes. Ischemia, um, <clears throat> you know, you want to think about, um, oh yeah, ischemia, the way that I, I remember ischemia is it has that C in it. I think the C in ischemia is for clotting. Um, and so it is, or you can think ischemia, like when we had ischemia in the heart was like a blockage. So this is a blockage stroke or a clot stroke. Um, and there's two types of ischemic strokes. You can either have a clot that's in the brain that forms in the brain. And this happens the same way, like a heart attack happens that you have plaques in your arteries in your brain. Um, they rupture a clot forms and it causes a complete blockage there. Um, so this, um, this, that can happen in the brain. Like there's a plaque problem in the brain. You have um, a lot of um, like high cholesterol, other cardiovascular risk factors. And eventually, um, you know, that that's what happens. Cause like, again, when you get plaques, they rupture, then the, the um, rupture of the plaques, the body's like, oh my God, I need to fix this. So um, a clot forms over top of it. And then platelets that love to hang together, they like the platelet parties, they, they make things worse and a, a blockage occurs. Um, so, but most people that have thrombotics have like diabetes, high cholesterol. They've been um, like, even, especially people that have been having a lot of TIAs back to back, um, they will, um, commonly have a thrombotic, um, uh, be more likely to have a thrombotic stroke. Um, now the good thing about thrombotic is, is that the body starts to sense, Hey, there's a flow or a clog issue here. And so they start to form collateral circulation. They do the same thing in the heart. If there's a coronary artery, that's not getting very good flow. They start to find other like fine detours. It's the same thing you would do is if you were driving to, um, to nursing school, which I know you're so excited to do all the time. Um, if you were driving to nursing school and the 
way you went to nursing school had horrible traffic. Eventually you'd be like, you know what, this way is not working out. I'm going to start taking a different road. And that's the same thing that the body does. Um, Cause thrombotic builds up over time. It's not a sudden thing. The difference there is that um, between then there's thrombotic. There's also like think thrombus, like a clot. There's also embolic. So embolic is a traveling clot. So embolic um, clot is a, again, it's a clot stroke, ischemic or blockage or C for um, the C in ischemic for clot type of stroke where someone had a clot somewhere else in the body. They had a DVT, they had one in their lungs, they have AFib and they have clots forming in their heart. And from the clot somewhere else in their body, it traveled to their brain. So the only thing that really matters here is this might come up in their story. Like the patient may tell you like, Oh, like um, that they suddenly, like all of a sudden, like, you know, had that um, like real, like quick, um, uh, what do you call them, out of nowhere kind of stroke symptoms. Now, again, um, without actually going in the brain, it's not going, there, there's no way to tell thrombotic versus embolic. Now we can speculate, like if a, a lot of times what happens is this is actually how we diagnose sometimes new onset of AFib is a patient will come in and they'll be, they'll have a, a stroke like out of nowhere. And then we'll check, do an EKG on them and there'll be an AFib. And now if they're an AFib, we are assuming they probably, you know, threw a clot. Now we may not never know. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter so much, but the big difference here is with a thrombotic, like the plaques are building over time. They're starting to clog. The body's saying, Hey, you know, I need to create some more circulation with embolic. They're not preparing. Everything's flowing just fine. Then out of nowhere, this traveling clot comes in and blocks. So they don't have the time to do that collateral circulation. So sometimes they can be a little bit more sudden, severe and scary, but not always. It just, it just depends. So just know it is in general. And we're not, cause we're not going to, we're not going to give you some scenario and be like, Oh, is it, a, is it um, thrombotic or embolic? We could ask you what's the difference in treatment between ischemic and hemorrhagic, but we cannot go in depth. And uh, so in depth that we would ask you like, you know, like, Hey, the patient had this story is it a thrombus or an embolus. You should know though, the different types that if I have a thrombotic or embolic stroke, it is a clot stroke. And here's some of the common risk factors. I either have a plaque problem, a blood vessel issue, um, or I'm um, throwing clots elsewhere like I have AFib. So then there's hemorrhagic strokes and same goes for this, that we're not going to sit there and be like, oh, is it intracerebral or is it subarachnoid? I'm um, like, you do not need to know that, but you need to understand there's um, a clot stroke and then there's a bleeding stroke. This is a bleeding stroke and you can remember um, bleeding stroke because it has the word heme or H-E-M, like you can think about like hematological disorders. Um, what do you call them? If you know what a hemorrhage is, a hemorrhage is bleeding. Um, so um, this is a bleeding stroke. And it's different in that usually as a result of too much pressure and aneurysm or that cocaine, like I mentioned, which can burst your blood vessels um, or trauma damage, stuff like that, um, causes bleeding in the brain. Um, but the same, like it still ends in um, brain tissue death. And so at the end of the day, it, it's still a stroke. It, it looks, it may look different, et cetera. Um, so remember we talked about hypertension being the main cause of, of strokes in general, but especially for hemorrhagic. So like when the, when patients, um, come in with strokes, like usually they are going to have a history of hypertension, but they're especially at risk for bleeding stroke with hypertension. Cause you have to think about, um, it's decreased, um, like there's the vasoconstriction, but it's also intense pressure. Like always think with hypertension, those really rusty pipes, um, those old pipes that, um, what do you call it? Eventually if there's too much pressure, they're going to burst. Um, this is what happens with hemorrhagic is there's too much pressure a lot of times, and it leads to like a literal bursting of the blood vessel or bleeding. And then because of that bursting blood vessel, there's there's literally like a disconnection of blood flow and cell um, brain cells start to die because there's no flow. Um, so with intracerebral hemorrhage, it's usually like a sudden onset, like they're engaged in activity. Um, and then with continued bleeding, their symptoms and stuff get worse. Um, whereas there's also what's known as a subarachnoid and usually subarachnoids are called, uh, caused by an aneurysm. Now you don't have to know in depth about aneurysm. I'm sure you'll learn them maybe somewhere in pediatrics or something like that. Um, but these are things that are like ticking time bombs in our head. And I'm, I don't say this to scare you, but I mean, there's probably a good handful of you that are listening to me that have an aneurysm right now in your brain. Now you will probably never know about it. You will never have any problems with it. But like I said, it's, it's kind of like a ticking time bomb where for some people, what happens is they just randomly burst and they can cause severe bleeding. Um, cocaine and hypertension increase that risk. So stay away from that cocaine. 
Um, and so um, also trauma or like head injuries can increase the risk of this. Um, these are, that's why they're called silent killers because these aneurysms, again, like they're not, they're no problem until they are. Um, and um, the thing we worry more about these because of the, with aneurysms and stuff like that, when people have a subarachnoid, they're more likely to have spasms. So there is a medication we're going to talk about later that we're more likely to give with this type of stroke um, versus others. Um, but you can see overall, okay, yeah, you can see overall that there's not a lot of difference. Um, there's not a lot we could test you over uh, between like, the different types of bleeding or the different types of ischemic strokes. It's more just about like the big deal here is, is you either have a clot or you have a disruption in your blood flow because of bleeding. And as a result, you're not getting blood flow to your brain. So that's the big like, aha, so what that we're trying to get to um, get here to you. Um, so that's really, everything's going to be about what treatment can we do now? Because this is what the issue is. Um, I thought I heard something. Yeah, I think it's my cat meowing. I had to lock the other cat in the room because um, that my cats, you know, one cat has dementia at night and stuff like that and it starts getting crazy. Um, but anyway, um, so there is a, there used to be um, just the, what is it? Like just the, like it was like think fast and now it's be fast or I don't remember what exactly what it used to be, but it used to be just four. I want to say it was just fast. Um, and then now it's be fast. That is like the, like, Priority assessments are the first things we do if we suspect, like, let's say you're at home and you're concerned when your family members is having a stroke. These are the things you want to kind of ask for or, or look for. Um, so we look at, do they have a sudden loss of balance? So sometimes like their, um, their balance is off. Um, vision changes, loss of vision in one or both eyes. Um, uneven face or facial droop. And that's where we have them. I, I always, I would tell a patient smile. And if they had facial droop, it would look like this. They'd be like, and they might be trying to like smile on one side, but can't smile on both arms is, is where there's, um, one sided weakness. So you want to look, and that's usually what we do is we have them like lift their arm up and then we see if they can hold their arm off. Like we do it with both arms and see, like we have them put their arms up and see if like one drifts down, um, <clears throat> speech is they have any slurred speech, any, um, trouble speaking or difference in their speaking. And for some of these patients, they're not going to know they're having any difference. Like they're going to think they're talking to you normally and you're not going to understand them. Um, and then time is not a symptom. It's just saying, hey, if they're having these symptoms, it's time to call 911. Um, I'm going to go real quick over this. And I think that, yeah, the next thing is, is one of the um, PowerPoints I already did. So I'm going to take a pause after this and then I'll go into um, left versus right stroke and sign, specific signs and symptoms. But let's talk real quick, um, just basics, like what am I looking for in a stroke? Um, so the symptoms really vary because again, it depends on what area of my brain is affected, um, which side of the brain experienced damage, but they can have stuff like um, facial droop, um, like I talked about that extremity weakness, speech problems, confusion, they may have a severe headache, the vision issues, um, difficulty with coordination. So it's really important that I do a comprehensive assessment. Um, we're going to do the GCS like for level of consciousness and the orientation, um, which is going to um, tell me about um, how they're doing, uh, what do you call it, with um, their awareness. Remember, um, if you've watched the other videos about neurological assessment, GCS is all about how awake they are and orientation is how aware they are of what's going on and who they are. Um, then there's the NIH stroke scale, which I'll have a separate video over. And this is where I, it's very specific for stroke and um, you have to assess for how many deficits they have. So this is looking at their like uh, what parts of their brain are affected. So it looks at visual issues, sensory, motor, speech, cognition. Um, it's very comprehensive. It's like a 42 point assessment. And I don't mean 42 th different things you have to do, but you can get like, I want to say the scale is like zero to 42 or something like that. Um, but anyway, that's it for, um, for this part. I will, um, uh, we could be jumping into signs and symptoms and other stuff with stroke next. See you there.